Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunayevskaya, Chapter 14, Stalin. Upon what meat hath this our Caesar fed, that he has grown so great? That was a quotation from Shakespeare. Stalin had once been a revolutionary, a Bolshevik, which meant an uncompromising fighter for the overthrow of Tsarism. <clears throat> um, there was a time when Bolshevism was a doctrine of liberation. Today, everyone knows Russian communism as the greatest barbarism on earth. Stalin is the name which symbolizes this. It was this one-time revolutionary who initiated and carried through with unmatched brutality, the greatest counter-revolution in all history. But Stalin is only the Russian name for a phenomenon that is worldwide. Two questions stand out. One, why does any individual behave like that? What objective movement in the economy, what class impulses necessitate such brutality? Two, what specific characteristics in a man enable him to become the receptacle and the executor of class impulses from an alien class, the very one he either challenged or actually helped overthrow? When the energies of the million-headed masses smashed the old and created the new, those who led the Russian Revolution could and did make great contributions to the greatest single fact of world history, the creation of the worker state. However, when the Russian working class was itself in a crisis, these intellectual leaders as individuals did not stack up very high. At a critical juncture in, a wor in world history, their, their will reflected the movement of the working class. But as Lenin pointed out in his will, a seriously false turn at that juncture could unloose the disin disintegrative forces at work in a dual worker-peasant state which is surrounded by world capitalism from which it cannot fully free itself without the help of the advanced European working class. As Lenin lay dying, the German Revolution failed, and in Russia's exhaustion, Stalin flourished. Stalin's outstanding trait was a bureaucratic attitude to the masses. He claimed to be a leader of the workers, but to him it meant to make the workers do as the leader wanted and told them to. He spoke of the party as the vanguard of the proletariat, but to him this meant that just as the leaders of the party were to tell the ranks what to do, so the party was to order the masses about. This was true of him as an individual, even when he was a revolutionary fighting in the underground. Once the Communist Party got into power, his passion for bossing came out in full bloom. It showed itself clearest of all in his attitude to the many nationalities which constitute the Soviet Union. In overthrowing the Tsarist monarchy, the Russian workers had fought not only to overthrow the capitalists and the landlords, but to overthrow as well the great Russian overlordship of the many nationalities in Russia. One of their first acts upon getting into power was to grant freedom to all the different nationalities that lived in Russia. But Stalin, though himself a Georgian, ran roughshod over the aspirations of his native Georgia, displaying a chauvinism and a national arrogance that was as rabid as that of any Tsarist official. Lenin drew back in horror. Scratch a Bolshevik, he wrote, and you will find a great Russian chauvinist. It remains the most precise commentary of the totalitarian personality in the making. Lenin's last appeal to Trotsky reads, I am declaring war on great Russian chauvinism. His last theoretical contribution on the national question continued. It is said we need a single apparatus. From where come such assertions? Is it not from the same Russian apparatus, which, as I have pointed out in one of the previous numbers of my diary, was borrowed from Tsarism and only barely anointed with the Soviet chrism? When Stalin began his, began his struggle for power as Lenin lay dying, he moved quite empirically. The road to power seemed obvious. It was to get control of the party, which was the state, which was the economy. To get the party which was in power meant to get control of its functionaries, those people who displayed a passion for bossing and whom Lenin had fought. These, these Stalin embraced. He knew them and knew how to talk to them. 
where Lenin appealed to the non-party masses to help him expose the vain communist bureaucrat. Stalin was later to appeal to the non-party careerists to flood the party and help defeat Trotsky. It wasn't, as Trotsky thought, because the new members didn't know the issues in, dis in dispute. It was that they chose what Stalin represented. No one, however, at that time conceived Stalin as a class enemy, not even Lenin, who had asked for his removal from the post of general secretary. Although Stalin was crafty enough, there is no point to assigning omniscience to him either. He didn't know what strong objective forces were pulling for him. He didn't have a theory about that. He let Bukharin carry the ball here while he shied away from fundamental theoretical questions. That does not mean that theory didn't matter to him, but as yet he didn't know what theory he would espouse. He was nowhere the medi he was nowhere the mediocrity mediocrity Trotsky made him out to be. He was capable enough when he wanted to win that way. It was he who made Trotsky argue on his ground, his fantastic notion of socialism in one country. It was he who made Trotsky's permanent revolution appear as an immediate adventuristic scheme that was out of all bounds for exhausted Russia in the 1920s. He wasn't playing intellectual games. He was playing for power. He maneuvered with one faction, then with another. He played the modest man who didn't hunger for Lenin's mantle and portrayed Trotsky as one who did. Thus, thus he defeated both the left and right oppositions and became the undisputed leader of the party. The first problem that confronted him when he won the victory of party power was that the Kulak refused to turn green over to the Soviet state. That decided the sudden zigzag for the abolition of the Kulak as a class. Just as the resulting chaos made him turn backwards with his, with his dizzy with the success speech. There wasn't a zigzag, however, that didn't rhyme with the strong pull of an, of an objective force. Once the Russian people, to a man, did not run the economy and the state, once the German Revolution, too, was defeated, once world capitalism regained its breath and the vortex of the world market had full sway, the logic of the Russian development was startling, unforeseen, but inevitable. The revolution then found the reality, seri the really serious counter-revolution inside itself. Stalin was the perfect representative of that counter-revolution, not only because his personality suited the task so well, but, above all, because he did come from the revolutionary party and did have command of the Marxist language. So corrupt and outlived is capitalism that it cannot hope to win except by pretending to be other than it is. Hitler too knew how to call his fascism national socialism. Stalin was Hitler's superior by far because his functionaries came from the working class. <clears throat> In Stalin's zigzags and lack of theoretical acumen was the straight line of development of the newly emergent world phenomenon of state capitalism. State capitalism. It now had a personality, a totalitarian personality, armed with a theory of totalitarianism called the monolithic party. Nor was the liquidation of the Kulak as a class as ludicrous as Trotsky made it appear. It is true, a class cannot be liquidated by a fiat. A class is such by virtue of its role in production, and production would have to be entirely differently motivated to overcome a class. That is certainly not a job to be done in a day or a year. But, objectively, this is not what Stalin meant. Objectively, the Kulak couldn't stand up to the combined might of state and industry. That was true even under or ordinary cir ordinary. That was true even under ordinary capitalism. Agriculture lost out to industry in the long run. Stalin saw that it happened in an enormously accelerated fashion. State power enforced collectivization so rapidly that he could dream of liquidating the Kulaks as a class. He first now became conscious of representing a new force, state power, the state plan, the state economy, the state party. There was going to be no withering away of his state. His rule was absolute and so was his theory and, and ideology. 
In 1931, Stalin's slogan, End Depersonalization, got nowhere. By 1934, however, when there was sufficient means of production built up and insufficient means of consumption to go around, there were enough opportunists to create a mass base for the ruling bureaucracy. Again, the creation of Stakhanovism was done in hothouse fashion. This time, however, as opposed to the time of liquidating Kulak resistance, there was but one purpose, to appropriate the wealth created by the workers. No ghost no ghost come from the grave was needed to tell him of this. Stalin concluded it was time to legitimize the new class called the classless intelligentsia. The new Stalin constitution likewise had no need for ghosts from the past. It was then that he planned the Makabur Moscow trials to kill off, at one and the same time, what was left of the general staff of the revolution and the workers who resisted the norms set by the plan. Stalin acted that way to the Russian people. He acted that way to Hitler. He, Stalin, set the conditions for the Nazi-Soviet pact. His share of Poland was one, only one of the territories he wanted. <coughs> what he didn't get from Hitler, namely all of Eastern Europe, he got from the Allies. When the war was over in 1945 and he was victor over his immediate enemy, he wanted to move straightway toward world conquest, especially if he could get others, Chinese and South Koreans, to do the fighting. Hitler used to rave and rant to his lieutenants of his envy and appreciation of the genius of Stalin, who had the pers perspe per perspicacity and audacity to get rid of the general staff of the Red Army before launching a world war. He knew whereof he spoke, for totalitarian economics has no room for a command divided between political and military needs. But by 1948, after two decades of undisputed power, topped by a military victory, Stalin, to use a phrase, to use a phrase of his own on another occasion, was dizzy with success. This is not used here as a psychological epithet. His exhilaration from success was a sign that he no longer was responsive to the objective needs requisite for a struggle for world power. The bureaucracy whom Stalin had so long and so fully represented began to find him inadequate to the new situation created by the end of a world war, which no one really won, but which left each of the two state capitalist giants so exhausted that a halt had to be called. Stalin failed to grasp the new situation. He had won a war, a mighty one, over Nazi Germany, yes. But he had yet to face the real contender for world power, the United States. Economists like Varga were saying that if plan means no general crisis, then there will be no general crisis in the private capitalist world. Plan, said Varga, is no longer a monopoly of socialism. The war showed that the Allies also planned and meant to continue to plan and not to let a depression follow the war. When top economist Maria Natonovna Smith spoke of state capitalism in the spirit in which Lenin had analyzed it, the book, she began, referring to Varga's work, lacks an analysis of the great new changes connected with the transition from simple monopoly capitalism to state monopoly capitalism, as Lenin understood this transition. During the war, world capitalism took a step forward, not only toward concentration in general, but also towards state capitalism in even a greater degree than formerly. Where Lenin unites the concept of state and of monopoly, uh, Commander Varga, or Com, Com, uh, I don't know, Com, <laughs> Com Varga, seems to separate them. Each exists by itself, and meanwhile, in fact, the process of coalescence of state with, with monopolists manifests itself quite sharply at the present time in such countries as the USA and England. This, for Stalin, was dangerous cosmopolitanism. It had to be fought, not in Varga nor in Maria Natanovna Smit, who had no power and could easily be made to sing another song. But among those closest to him, the Politburo members who were deviating. The first to go was Voznesensky, chairman of the State Planning Commission. How 
Pyrrhic was Pyrrhic was Stalin's victory could be seen in the unrest in the national republics which constitute Russia. By a Yukasi of the Supreme Soviet, five autonomous republics were liquidated. Russia had suffered the greatest devastation and was in crying need for a labor force to rebuild the country. It could not hope to have, have that force enlarged by the return of slave, slave laborers in Hitler's Germany. Too many had willingly escaped from the prison which was Stalin's Russia. Anyone who was in Germany at the end of the war knows that long before Koje, the Korean War and the massacre of POWs, a veritable civil war was going on in the Russian displaced persons camps. But the Allies forced the Russians to return to their homeland. The restlessness of the Russian masses knew no bounds. <coughs> If they were merely to go on in the same old way, keeping their noses to the grindstone, then at least it would not be in the godforsaken Urals. The totalitarian Russian bureaucracy had all the power and all the force and all the laws it needed to enforce labor discipline, but absolutely nothing could stem the tide of resistance of returning Russians. The tide invalidated all laws. To have a labor force at all, the planners were compelled to make an unplanned declaration an amnesty for all labor offenses committed during the war. So catastrophic, however, had been the decline of the labor force during the war years, a drop from 31.2 million in 1940 to 27.2 million in 1945, with more than a third of these unskilled new women workers, that even the amnesty was insufficient to create the labor force necessary. Thereupon occurred one of the speediest demobilizations of an army anywhere in the world. No fewer than 10 million were demobilized between 1945 and 1947. By 1948, Stalin had only one colleague fully with him in the headlong rush to World War III, and he, Zdanov, was assassinated without the great leader knowing. This was the beginning of the end of Stalin's power. <coughs> By 1950, the Russian economy had about got back to normal when Stalin had a brainstorm. It was known as the Stalin plan for the transformation of nature. To put the scheme into effect, Stalin brought to Moscow one N. Khrushchev from the Ukraine, where he had been premier. This man had been ruthless enough to put down actual armed insurrection, and now he was given the job to announce the most fantastic scheme yet, the creation of Agrogorods, agricultural towns. Just like that, decree them, and they shall arise and abolish the centuries old distinction between city and country. Instead of abolishing the distinction between city and country, this scheme brought such chaos to the countryside that even in this land of monolithic planning, the idea had to be shelved in a few months. <coughs> it was easy enough to have songs written about this irrigation which would soon produce enough food to feed 100 million people. It was something quite different to con convince the peasant to transport at his own expense and his own time, his little hut in the collective farm to the agro town, which was yet to be created. While the apartment house in which he was to live like a worker had not only been not been built, it had not even been planned. But if Stalin had to be satisfied with something less than the abolition of the difference between city and country, he was going full speed ahead towards a head-on collision with the United States, at least where he could get the Koreans and the Chinese to do the fighting for him. There was no breathing spell, let alone peace. Yugoslavia had defected. The iron fisted Stalin was clearly becoming a millstone around the neck of the bureaucracy which yearned for a truce between wars. Stalin may have read the handwriting on the wall. He certainly took no chances with his two eager, eager heirs. Though he let Melenkov read the main address at the 19th Congress, he made his greatest bid to remain the immortal theoretician with his 1952 magnum opus, Economic Problems of Socialism. This, which we may call Stalin's last testament, is the most pathetic document that ever a tyrant left his fighting heirs. After a quarter of a century of plans and what he assured them was the actual transition from socialism to full communism, Stalin's mighty labors 
brought forth only the need to merge the peasant's private allotment adjoining the collective farm into the collective itself. Upon this private garden, rightly called in this country, an acre and a cow, evidently depends the building of full communism. This, plus the gradual abolition of the collective farm market and substitution of products exchange for money exchange, will bring them to communism in a single country. That was little enough of a legacy to leave his bureaucratic heirs. But the Russian masses, who know that Stalin doesn't go in for theory unless he plans to apply it, made one grand rush to transform their money into manufactured products. Consumer goods and the peasants at the same time withheld farm products. This does not mean that it was the Stalin thesis and not the actual difficulties, particularly in agriculture and particularly since Korea that created the crisis. Nevertheless, it is true that it was the closest to panic Russia had been since forced collectivization took its toll in 1932. The minute Stalin was buried, the bureaucracy ran from his last testament like rats from a sinking ship. This absolute tyrant who, when alive, could command the adulation, son of the Himalayas, was forgotten ere a single sundown. This does not mean that his battling heirs fundamentally changed a single part of the state capitalist structure they inherited, either before or after de-Stalinization. They continue communism as a system of the most sweated labor in a modern industrial society, buttressed by a vast co complex of spies and counter-spies. <clears throat> the counter-spies are not foreign agents. They are party men who spy on the police, who spy on the party men, and both spy on the people. This does not mean the death of Stalin brought about the new conflicts in Russia. It would be far more correct to say that the continuous inner crisis in Russia had produced Stalin's death. It does mean that the death of Stalin symbolizes the beginning of the end of totalitarianism, not on the part of his heirs, but from the forced labor camps in the wilds of Siberia that buttress the Russian regime. But before the challenge from Vorkuta, the bell of freedom sounded in East Berlin in the heart of Europe.